Hello, it's nice to be with you this morning. I'm going to talk about biology of waterborne pathogens. And uh, I work at uh, a research and extension center uh, about 30 miles south of uh, Seattle. And my primary area of research is uh, diseases on ornamental bulb crops, uh, conifer nursery stock. I do work on sudden oak death, uh, have for a number of years, and uh, work on the diseases of Christmas trees, uh, uh, including quite a bit of work on Phytophthora, uh, root rot there, as well as post-harvest quality aspects of Christmas trees. But today I'll be uh, giving an overview of plant pathogens and disease development, the uh, role of water in disease development, pathogens reported in irrigation uh, water. We'll talk about biology of pathogens in water, and then uh, we'll spend some time talking about the biology of uh, Phytophthora and Pythium uh, in water. And in general, uh, this is a lot of background information. I'm sure most of you are probably already well aware of this. But uh, uh, diseases are typically uh, categorized into two different uh, types of diseases, those that are infectious or uh, biotic diseases. Uh, they're caused by true fungi, oomycetes, viruses, bacteria, phytoplasmas, uh, and nematodes. And then there's a group of uh, non-infectious uh, or abiotic diseases. Uh, these would include things like environmental stress, chemical toxicities, nutrient deficiencies, uh, uh, things that are not caused by a, a living organism. Uh, plant pathologists like to talk about a disease triangle. Uh, I sort of have a modified disease triangle here in that uh, the components of a disease triangle are uh, the pathogen, the host, and the environment. And unless uh, these three uh, things come together uh, at the same time, and by host we mean a susceptible host, uh, if they don't come together uh, for a, a suitable a period of time, uh, you don't have disease developing. If you have these three uh, factors coming together, uh, you'll have, a, for a brief period of time, you may have a low level of disease. And if you have a continual uh, period of time in which all three of these uh, uh, factors occur at the same time, uh, your disease potentially could be quite uh, severe. Uh, there is a uh, time component to this. And so some plant pathologists uh, talk actually about a disease pyramid that on one side has the disease triangle, on the other has the uh, time component. And uh, for example, uh, periods of uh, leaf wetness uh, can influence uh, infection and sporulation. And so if you have minimal periods of leaf wetness, you may have a minimal amount of disease, longer periods of leaf wetness, uh, a longer amount of disease. And then you have a, a, an incubation time in which uh, it takes a period of time for symptoms to develop. Water plays an important role in uh, disease development. Uh, it provides conditions that are favorable for sporulation and infection uh, for many uh, diseases. Uh, it's also important as it relates to the dissemination of pathogens. Uh, a couple examples would be the spread of infested soil or media and infested uh, plant residues by surface water that runs over uh, uh, an area uh, in a field uh, where you may have soil that's uh, infested and it's moving a uh, 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 inoculum uh, in that soil along with the water. It also uh, potentially disseminates a pathogen uh, inoculum directly uh, uh, by disseminating spores. Uh, so examples of uh, the importance of water, of uh, botrytis blight, uh, uh, which is caused by several different species of botrytis on uh, lilies, uh, is a foliar disease. Uh, not typically, tr uh, the inoculum isn't typically uh, disseminated by water, but leaf wetness, uh, prolonged leaf wetness results in severe uh, disease development, uh, as seen in these uh, uh, photos here. Conversely, if you have uh, 
extended periods of water or saturated soil conditions, uh, this tends to be very favorable for diseases such as Phytophthora root rot, <clears throat> which tend to occur in areas with uh, poor uh, soil drainage. There's another thing that a lot of times we don't think about where with certain crops, uh, the crop or a particular stage of the crop may be exposed to water for washing it uh, or for sanitizing it uh, for some other uh, agent. And in the case of ornamental bulb crops, which I do quite a bit of work on, uh, hot water treatments are commonly used to control uh, nematodes as well as a variety of insects and fungal pathogens that are carried on these vegetatively propagated uh, 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 bulbs. Uh, however, in the case of fusarium basal rot, uh, particularly on daffodils, uh, the uh, treatment uh, is not of sufficient temperature to kill all of the inoculum. And on the right-hand side, you'll see a, uh, uh, a colony uh, forming units so when a, an aliquot of dip tank solution is uh, uh, placed on media, uh, selected for fusaria prior to the hot water treatment. And then uh, the reduction in colony forming units after the hot water treatment. Although it reduces the, the spore load in the tank, it doesn't particularly, uh, it doesn't completely eliminate uh, the spores. So therefore, if you were to take bulbs and, uh, that had some disease bulbs in them and put them in a dip tank uh, to give them a hot water treatment without a, a biocide in there, you would have a situation like this data where the dry check bulbs uh, are planted out and then the following year the amount of basal rot is 12.4 percent. If we put them in just the hot water alone without a biocide, uh, the following year we have 98.2 percent of the bulb uh, stock uh, has basal rot. Uh, so um, water can be an important mechanism during treatments of some uh, uh, crops for cleaning them or other types of treatments such as hot water uh, treatments on these bulbs. Also water uh, in excess or in deficiencies uh, can predispose plants to disease development. Uh, in other words, uh, we want to avoid having uh, stressed uh, plants and therefore if plants are properly watered uh, and uh, we have a healthy crop, we're much less likely to have uh, disease problems. If we look at the pathogens that are reported in irrigation water, uh, Hung and uh, Mormon in 2005 did a review of um, uh, pathogens in the irrigation water. When you look at this paper, you'll see that um, some of the uh, reports are for detection of pathogens in water, uh, such as ponds or streams not necessarily always in irrigation water. Uh, but uh, they reported uh, a number of uh, pathogens, uh, primarily the oomycetes, the phytophoras and pythiums. But there were 27 species of true fungi, uh, eight species of bacteria, 10 species of viruses, and 13 species of nematodes that were uh, reported. We're going to kind of go in reverse order here and uh, look at some of these. And the uh, plant parasitic nematodes are non-segmented roundworms. Uh, these are obligate parasites uh, with a hollow needle-like feeding structure called a stylet. Uh, they have a very relatively simple life cycle, developing into a complete worm within eggs prior to hatching and then going through four larval stages before they become uh, reproductive uh, adults. Uh, there's two groups, uh, ectoparasites that move from plant to plant and endoparasites uh, that remain on the same plant. And a couple, there's, I have three examples here of some nematodes that had been reported uh, in this paper to be associated or, or detected in water. Water is an important uh, factor in the spread of nematodes um, uh, on plants. Uh, the foliar nematode, Aphylinchoides, and the Didolinchus, the stem and bulb nematode, uh, when plants, uh, the surface of plants are wet, these nematodes can actually uh, crawl and spread over the surface of the uh, uh, 
the, the plant uh, as long as there's moisture there. Uh, and so free moisture on the plant uh, is an important uh, aspect of the spread. Uh, next is plant uh, pathogenic viruses. Uh, these are uh, submicroscopic uh, intracellular agents that are composed mostly uh, of, of nucleic acid and uh, coat proteins. Uh, all viruses are obligate parasites. Uh, they cannot uh, reproduce outside of a living host cell. And viruses are transmitted um, typically from plant to plant by insects, nematodes, mites. Uh, some are mechanically transmitted. And then there's uh, an oomycetes uh, uh, that uh, can transmit uh, some viruses as well. Uh, Viruses are particularly damaging on vegetatively propagated crops and are very prone to build up uh, of uh, that are very prone to build up of virus diseases. Uh, there's a number of examples uh, that I've uh, listed here. It's interesting that tobacco necrosis uh, virus and the lettuce, lettuce big vein uh, virus are actually uh, transmitted uh, by an oomycete, which of course uh, is a water mold and is favored by uh, high soil moistures. Uh, so water plays a role in the viability of the vector uh, in this uh, particular case. When we look at bacteria, uh, these are prokaryotic single-celled organisms that do not have membrane-bound organelles. Uh, the bacteria have cell walls and often have a flagella, uh, which is a, uh, a small structure on the uh, spore. Uh, and uh, they allow uh, the bacterial cell to move through liquids. Uh, they infect through natural openings and wounds, and uh, moisture is very important uh, uh, for this process. Uh, there are a number of bacteria which have been reported to be uh, detected in water, and some of these uh, can be very serious. Again, much like the basal rot example, where you have infected stock uh, it being uh, exposed to water, and then that water uh, that is now contaminated with the bacteria being used to uh, treat other healthy stock. Uh, the true fungi uh, are eukaryotic organisms that include yeast, molds, and uh, mushrooms. Uh, their cells uh, have cell walls that contain chitin and uh, they're more closely related to animals than plants. They're incapable of producing their own food. Uh, the majority of these are actually saprophytic and uh, decomposed dead organic material. And as a group, they cause a number of economically important uh, diseases uh, during the production and post-harvest uh, uh, aspects of handling various crops. These include soil-borne fungi, such as Fusarium and Rhizoctonia, and aerial pathogens uh, such as uh, botrytis. By far the most important uh, group of uh, pathogens that is uh, transmitted by uh, water or disseminated by water are members of the oomycetes. These are fungal-like organisms that are more closely related to brown algae than true fungi. Uh, their cell walls are composed of cellulose uh, rather than chitin. And uh, they produce modal spores, which are known as zoospores, that uh, spread in the water. So these are swimming types of spores. Usually they have one or two flagella. And these flagella are sort of like little oars or whips uh, that uh, propel the spore through the water. Uh, Pythium and uh, Phytophthora are water molds uh, in this group and are uh, frequently cause diseases when plants are planted in poorly drained soil or uh, are over irrigated or in some uh, specialized uh, production systems like we see in recirculated systems in some greenhouses. Alpidium brassicae is the uh, oomycete, which is a water mold that does uh, transmit uh, uh, the virus uh, that we already uh, talked about. Now I'd like to spend uh, the uh, time talking about the biology of Phytophthora and Pythium, uh, since these are uh, the most common and most probably the most important uh, 
uh, pathogens that are disseminated uh, in water. Uh, these pathogens, as I already indicated, are water mold that are adapted to wet soils and commonly cause diseases in poorly drained soils and some types of greenhouse uh, production systems. Uh, this particular person at a nursery is standing in uh, two to three inches of water uh, in amongst the pots. This is a super conducive environment uh, for the spread of uh, particular, uh, particularly Phytophthora and uh, Pythium. Uh, Phytophthoras are aquatic organisms, uh, as are Pythium. Uh, some species have very narrow host range, such as uh, Phytophthora and Festens, which causes late blight. Uh, while other species attack many hosts, uh, and examples there would be Phytophthora cinnamomi and uh, Phytophthora romorum. Uh, the number of known species uh, is increasing. Uh, each year there are new species uh, described, uh, and most of the Phytophthoras cause root rots, but some attack aerial portions of plants, causing uh, foliar leaf spots, diebacks, uh, and stem cankers. Uh, the name Phytophthora actually means plant destroyer, and uh, probably the most famous uh, Phytophthora uh, is the Phytophthora infestin, which was responsible for the Irish potato famine uh, in the 1840s. Uh, Phytophthora cinnamomi is another very common and widespread Phytophthora uh, that causes problems not only in nurseries but also in forest uh, situations. And there's just a number of these Phytophthoras that attack agricultural and uh, uh, ornamental horticultural uh, crops. Uh, there are several species that uh, causes uh, root uh, disease on rhododendrons, and there's a series of uh, there's a number of species that also cause uh, some foliar uh, problems as well. Uh, Phytophthoras can cause significant losses in areas where poor soil drainage. Uh, particularly in, in these pictures uh, showing uh, conifers, uh, particularly true firs, the AB species, are quite susceptible to uh, various Phytophthora species. These water molds uh, can easily be spread via irrigation water. This is a picture from North Carolina where uh, in the, this area here is on a hill up above these trees. An octum runs down into this retention pond down here. This retention pond was then used to uh, irrigate the uh, transplant bed, and uh, you end up, uh, the grower ended up uh, having significant uh, uh, Phytophthora issues uh, in this uh, uh, transplant uh, bed. Also, when overhead uh, irrigated uh, with contaminated water, uh, you can get direct infection of. Uh, aerial portions of plants, such as branches on these noble fir Christmas trees uh, that uh, were irrigated uh, with uh, pond water uh, that had Phytophthora. The Phytophthora uh, infected through the needles and uh, caused the dieback uh, on these uh, uh, branches. And normally these Phytophthoras would only be found uh, uh, in the soil, causing a root rot and lower stem canker. Pythium, uh, Gary Mormon at Penn State University has been doing a lot of work on pythiums in uh, ornamental situations and provided me with some slides and information. And um, there's about 200 different species. About 100 of these are plant pathogens. There's also some animal pathogens. And then parasites uh, of other uh, fungi. Uh, pythium is found in uh, all types of environments, soil, sand, surface water, and in water uh, you can have sediments, organic uh, matter, and they can be free uh, swimming uh, zoospores as well. Pythiums are fast growing, uh, reproduce quickly, and sur uh, survive uh, uh, long periods of time uh, via oospores. They're a significant problem in greenhouse production of ornamental crops, particularly when we have recirculated uh, water systems. Uh, they're, uh, Disease development by this pathogen is favored by wet uh, soil conditions, and pythiums cause damping off root rots, stem rots, can rot the, the ends of cuttings, and they can cause uh, foliar uh, blights as well. Um, here, the poinsettia uh, would have a uh, root rot caused by pythium. 
see wilting. Sometimes it might only wilt during the middle of the day, recover uh, partially at night uh, when the temperatures are cooler and transpiration levels go down only to wilt again the next day. And then when enough roots become uh, damaged, uh, uh, you begin to see permanent wilting. On the left is a picture of uh, cottonwood, a healthy cottonwood, and then a, uh, a cottonwood seedling uh, that uh, has uh, pythium on it. And if you were to take a small uh, root sample from there, you'd likely see uh, a tremendous number of oospores uh, within these uh, tissues. These oospores can either survive uh, as uh, survival structures, or they can uh, germinate uh, directly, cause of infection, or germinate to produce sporangia and release zoospores and uh, spread the disease. So in uh, nursery situations, particularly infested organic material, uh, is an important source uh, of inoculum. And growers uh, uh, really need to pay a lot of attention to hygiene and sanitation in trying to reduce and eliminate uh, the exposure of water sources, particularly in a recirculating uh, situation, uh, to uh, uh, infested materials such as uh, organic debris. Identification of Phytophthora and Pythiums. Uh, historically, it's been done and still is to a certain degree uh, based on the shapes and sizes of uh, the spores they produce and the growth characteristics on the laboratory uh, media. Uh, here's some uh, panels of some pictures out of a recent publication by Jung uh, in 2011 uh, from Western Australia where he's uh, describing uh, a series of uh, new Phytophthora species that are found in aquatic uh, environments. So just pictures showing the different types of sporangia, uh, the sporangia germination and the types of mycelium and uh, zoospores. Uh, and chlamydospores and uh, oospores that are produced. Also, growth on uh, different media uh, is typically uh, used as uh, a criteria to help uh, identify these species. Uh, in this uh, panel, we see four media, V8, uh, malt extract auger, cornmeal, uh, potato dextrose, and uh, four different species of uh, uh, Phytophthora that are grown uh, on these to show the different uh, colony of uh, characteristics. Uh, we'd also look at uh, the temperature optima as well as the uh, lethal temperature at which uh, no growth occurs. Uh, more and more, though, molecular based uh, tools are being used to identify uh, Phytophthora, Pythiums, and many other uh, pathogens. Uh, and these are largely uh, utilizing uh, uh, DNA from uh, ITS regions uh, and PCR equipment for amplification and sequencing. And within uh, the Phytophthora and Pythium, these uh, molecular uh, uh, approaches have uh, resulted in uh, significant increases in our ability to identify Phytophthora and Pythium and determining and determine their relationship to each other. This is an old uh, uh, tree, uh, if you will, uh, showing relationships uh, among different Phytophthoras. Within Phytophthoras and Pythiums, the, uh, the species that are closely related are grouped into what are known as clades. In this uh, picture here, we see a, a total of eight clades uh, for Phytophthora. Clade number six, which I'll come back to later on, is a group of Phytophthoras that are primarily aquatic and are very commonly found if one was to go out and bait water in ponds or streams or uh, lakes. Similar approaches are used to identify uh, Pythium uh, from a standpoint of molecular characteristics as well as uh, morphological characteristics. Uh, Gary Moorman uh, also, uh, to get some of the morphological characteristics, uh, he uses an approach where he boils rye leaf, uh, leaf blades and puts them in sterile uh, distilled water, puts some, uh, an auger plug next to them, uh, and then incubates it for a period of time and removes the soil extract and then looks at the mycelium with the cover slips and observes the, uh, the 
oospores and the sporangia, this is a good way to get good sporulation uh, for uh, these pythiums. The Phytophthora and uh, Pythium life cycles are very similar. Uh, they uh, both produce uh, long-lived spores. In the case of Phytophthora, it can be oospores or chlamydospores. Uh, not all Phytophthora species produce uh, both of these, uh, but uh, they're going to produce one or both. Uh, and these structures under favorable condition will germinate to produce sporangia. These sporangia will then uh, germinate uh, and either cause direct infection or uh, more likely they will germinate to produce zoospores, uh, which then will swim in water uh, to a suitable a susceptible host tissue and cause infection. Once infection has taken place, the mycelial uh, growth of the pathogen occurs in the tissues. We see symptom development. Additional uh, uh, spores are produced, uh, uh, and we can have uh, them going right back and producing a sporangia directly uh, on the tissue and additional zoospores, and the disease continues to, to build up and spread. Uh, here's a little more complex, uh, colorful uh, uh, description of the pythium life cycle. Start over here with a overwintering oospore can germinate directly, cause infection, or uh, produce a, a sporangium. And unlike Phytophthora, where the uh, contents of the sporangium differentiates into zoospores within the sporangium, uh, in the case of uh, pythium, uh, a vesicle is uh, released. The contents of the uh, uh, sporangium is released into the vesicle. It then is differentiated into the uh, zoospores, which are then released and then can swim. And pythium can in cause infections on seeds, seedlings, uh, or small uh, plants uh, and uh, cause damping off, uh, et cetera and you get symptoms developing, more sporulation, a repeating of the cycle until the plant's killed, and then a production of uh, the uh, oospores that are going to survive in the uh, dead leaf debris or plant debris. Pythium can also be ingested and moved by fungus gnats uh, for short distances or shore flies uh, for uh, longer distances. What's really important when we talk about uh, these pythium and phytophthoras uh, are their ability to produce the sporangia and zoospores. It's the zoospores primarily that are uh, responsible for the spread of these pathogens in uh, water. Uh, and the graphs of uh, phytophthora morum, uh, sporangia, as well as over here, uh, zoospores that have been released, and that's these swimming zoospores. Uh, that are responsible for the spread in water. Uh, zoospores are released and, uh, in the, and present in water. There's some unique features about zoospores. They tend to be negatively uh, geotrophic. That is, they'll rise to the surface. Uh, they're uh, chemotrophic in that they're uh, attracted to chemicals released by uh, the host plant. Uh, and then there's a variety of approaches that are used to uh, detect uh, the presence of these pathogens in water, such as filtration uh, and baiting. And baits can be uh, fruits or leaves, uh, leaf pieces, seedlings, or cotyledons. Uh, zoospores, uh, they have these flagella, in this case two flagella. Uh, the shorter flagella is primarily the one that uh, rotates and uh, uh, provides the motility to the spores. Uh, once these spores come in contact with a suitable substrate, they will uh, sort of uh, settle down uh, against that substrate. The spore begins to form a, a cell wall. They don't have a cell wall while they are modal and they uh, exude materials that uh, attach them to that surface, and then uh, germination uh, and penetration uh, and infection of that uh, tissue occurs. These four stages can occur uh, quite rapidly, uh, and uh, so you can go from uh, a moving spore uh, to infection in about 30 to 40 uh, minutes. 
Typically, these spores, uh, in the case of uh, roots, uh, will uh, be attracted through chemotaxis to the uh, exudates from the root tip, where they will insist. And you see a series of uh, pythium uh, insisted zoospores here that are germinating, and the germ tubes are penetrating uh, uh, into the host uh, uh, tissue. Steve Chesfold uh, is a uh, uh, person who works on ornamental diseases, particularly Phytophthora morum in uh, California, works with uh, UC Cooperative Extension, and he's run a series of experiments uh, to look at the effect of irrigation or rain on sporulation and spread of Phytophthora morum into runoff water. And uh, these are fairly elaborate experiments uh, conducted with using uh, rhododendrons and uh, camellias, uh, where he's either relying on natural rain or uh, irrigation, monitoring the uh, spore loads coming off of spores following rain events and irrigation events, and then looking at uh, collecting runoff and finding out how much inoculum's in the runoff and collecting leachate in the pots to see how much uh, is in the uh, pots and whether there's uh, infection in the, uh, the, the root system. Um, and I guess we dropped the slide. What he found was uh, that um, that rain was very important in uh, in stimulating sporulation uh, and uh, production of inoculum that did run off into the uh, water. Uh, uh, irrigation also uh, did this, but to less of a degree than uh, rain uh, and um, and then that uh, the contaminated water uh, was able to cause uh, foliar infections as well as uh, root infections. Uh, this has uh, significant implications as it relates to when we think about uh, the movement of inoculum in a nursery situation. Uh, in the case where we've been studying the spread of Phytophthora morum in nurseries in Washington, uh, we have uh, in, infected plants in a nursery situation. We have water, uh, excess water that's uh, running uh, around the plants uh, and running off the site. And what we see is here's a nursery where we have positive uh, plants, waters uh, moving off these positive plants, carrying inoculum off the nursery site into a drainage ditch that goes along the road. And uh, because of that inoculum, uh, plants along the drainage ditch are exposed to the inoculum, become infected, and then we also have contamination of the soil in the drainage ditch. In the case of Phytophthora morum, where this is a regulated pathogen, uh, this is a, a pretty serious uh, issue. The other thing is, uh, once it's in the water, it can move for an extended period uh, or an extended distance uh, from the original nursery site. The same thing can be happening on water that's moving around in the nursery uh, situation itself. There's another nursery in western Washington where we have uh, water that's uh, positive for remorum uh, from some plants into a holding pond and then water off this way. And here uh, is a nursery and about six miles away in a drainage uh, uh, water that drains into a creek that uh, comes from that nursery. Uh, again, we've been able to detect Phytophthora morum. So these uh, spores can move for a long distance uh, in these waterways. Everett Hansen uh, at Oregon State University has done a lot of work with Phytophthora, particularly in forest situations. He and others uh, that are working with Romorum have shown this diurnal, uh, or not diurnal, but a, a seasonal uh, fluctuation. Uh, primarily related probably to levels of sporulation uh, on uh, host plants uh, uh, that are contributing inoculum to uh, streams in the forest situations. Uh, Dave Risso at UC Davis has recently done some work looking at the ability of Romorum to colonize fresh and dead leaf tissues in streams. There's really a lot of questions about what these phytophthoras are doing once they get into streams how they're persisting and things like this. And it was interesting when he used dried or frozen leaves as, uh, uh, as baits. Uh, so he froze the leaves and then thawed them and then put them in the water and compared that with fresh leaves. 
got no Phytophthora morum, uh, but a number of other Phytophthora species uh, where you use the uh, fresh leaves, you got 74% Phytophthora morum plus a number of uh, other Phytophthora species. So it doesn't appear that Phytophthora morum is uh, sort of colonizing dead and uh, a leaf litter in the uh, stream. It appears to only be colonizing uh, the fresh uh, leaves. Everett has done a lot of work uh, looking at baiting streams. And one of the things, uh, his question, and a, lo a lot of people are asking this question, where, where do the Phytophthoras uh, in these streams come from? Uh, in some cases, they may be coming from nursery plants. Uh, that can be fairly clear. But once we get away from a stream or in a pond, sometimes we don't really have an understanding. When you bait these uh, streams, the people that are doing this work, what they largely find are a large number of these uh, uh, stream resident phytophthoras that belong to this clade six. And uh, these are generally considered to be saprophytic. Uh, there's some question that they might be facultative pathogens. In, in other words, under certain conditions, they may be able to cause disease, uh, uh, minor amounts of disease on some host. Uh, Everett has done work in southwest Oregon, western Oregon, and in Alaska. And here's the percentage of uh, stream baits where he's recovering uh, Phytophthora species that belong to clade six. So they're quite common in these aquatic uh, systems. Also, uh, Everett feels that uh, some of the uh, inoculum may be coming from roots and soil uh, near the, the stream uh, itself. And then there's another uh, source of potential inoculum where uh, you might have infections in the canopy of plants. Uh, those leaves uh, fall into the water, uh, and you get inoculum then introduced into the water. Uh, and what he sees in a forest situation, typically these are uh, Phytophthora species that belong to clade three. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, there's really a poor understanding of how these Phytophthoras are surviving what they're surviving on in these aquatic uh, environments. So in summary, understanding the biology of waterborne pathogens is necessary for the development of effective management uh, programs. Uh, Gary Mormon uh, gave me this slide uh, where he sort of outlined some things to think about from a management of a pythium. And I'm not going to talk about management uh, today. Uh, that's covered in a number of other uh, webinars. But when you just look at Pythium, and in this, uh, uh, this greenhouse production system here, uh, you could have inoculum from soil uh, from outdoors, soil under or between the benches. You could have contaminated initial water, contaminated water that is back coming into the reservoir. Maybe you introduce some infected plants. Uh, the inocula spread off these plants into the floor. Once you have a disease, you might have debris from a previous crop. You can have contaminated potting soil. And you could have shore uh, flies that are moving inoculum from one area in the greenhouse uh, to another. It's important to think about these different pathways, if you will. And I think Jennifer Park from Oregon State University next week uh, or in the next webinar is going to talk about critical points uh, as it relates to Phytophthora. And part of that is looking at uh, these pathways and where the critical points are uh, where uh, disease is likely to uh, originate. It is important to uh, test irrigation water uh, sources for the presence of pathogens, particularly open source water. It's not likely that these pathogens are going to be found in well water if the well is properly sealed uh, at the soil surface. Uh, usually, what you're going to find is if you have open sources of water, such as a retention pond, uh, or a stream, or a lake, or in recirculated water systems uh, where the water becomes contaminated, uh, you may have pathogens introduced. And it's important to understand what pathogens uh, are present in uh, the water. Uh, and some of this testing uh, needs to be done you know, as it comes through the irrigation system, or maybe more effectively here to look at the effectiveness of any treatments that are being applied. 
And the last point would be that sanitation, sanitation, sanitation is critical, as is water management. We have situations where we go to nurseries where we have standing water and pots in that standing water. We have water here uh, on a road, people walking through this, carrying uh, mud over to where the plants are. Uh, all of these are sources of how uh, disease uh, inoculum can be spread. So sanitation, water management, and water treatment are important components uh, in developing an effective management program. With that, I'd like to thank you, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone might have. Hi, Gary. Thank you very much. We have a few questions. One is, from a management standpoint, is it necessary to identify pathogens like PKMFI talker to the species level? Uh, it may not be to the species level. I think it becomes more important uh, if we're talking about uh, some other pathogens because uh, some of these pathogens do vary on their sensitivity because of the spore types they have. And so if you have a uh, pathogen that tends to have uh, primarily thick-walled spores, for example, uh, those are going to be much more difficult to control, let's say, with a, an oxidizer or a biocide uh, than ones that have thin walls. Okay. We have another question is, you talk about the importance of testing irrigation water sources for the presence of pathogen. And the question is, where can a grower get a water sample tested for the presence and type of Phytophthora or Pythium species in their water and how much does it cost? That's a really good question. <laughs> There's probably someone uh, listening, or maybe you have a, a better answer than, uh, than I have. Uh, there are relatively few places I know of uh, that do this. It tends to be at private laboratories. And uh, to be honest with you, um, uh, that's an issue that we have out here as far as some of our growers, uh, where they can get testing. And some of the labs that used to do this are no longer in business. And a last question is that growers think about treating incoming water to avoid diseases, but in some cases should they also be collecting and treating runoff water before that leaves the property if I talk to or more is in their property? Uh, I think this is a, a major issue uh, because uh, in the case of Phytophthora morum, it's pretty clear that we have uh, water running off of nurseries that are that is contaminated, and therefore we're introducing uh, that inoculum into streams. Uh, in some cases, streams that are used, being used downstream of the nursery uh, for irrigation purposes. Uh, it may not be feasible for individual nurseries to treat that water before it runs off, but certainly nurseries who would be using any water from a source that has been contaminated need to be aware of that and need to seriously uh, think about treating that water so that they don't introduce a pathogen like remorum into their site and have to suffer the regulatory consequences of that. <laughs> 